Hello, and welcome to the Building Blocks of Deep Learning, where we learn how and when to use layers. Uh, and today we're going to be learning about the recurrent neural network layers. Um, so we've uh, something that you might have noticed is that as these as these um, videos progress on, there's more structure that we as human beings note in the underlying data. So previously we had basically very little structure at all. It's just all numeric data. And then we had categorical data, which we know some things about. Um, then we had uh, variable length features. Uh, when we when we talked about variable length features, we, we basically assumed that uh, you had sets of features that were generated in the exact same way. Right. So a credit card feature, these credit card features are going to be very, very similar to each other. Um, so it's multiple credit cards. Uh, in this case, uh, we've got variable length features. Uh, so they're generated in a single in a way, but they are ordered. So each each data point has a set of features that are ordered. Um, so it, our example in the past was that you were trying to judge someone uh, whether they would default on a loan based on uh, their credit cards. And those credit cards, there's no real intrinsic ordering to them. Uh, now, in our case, let's say we wanted to change this up a little bit and and judge whether someone would be um, uh, good for a loan based on their monthly statements. So in this case, like a previous month statement and the month before that and the month before that. So, you know, 10 months or something like that. Um, now these statements do have a, a variable length. Some people might only have three, some people might have 10, you know, some people might have 12 months. You might cap it at sort of 12 months looking back. Um, but there's also an order. There's there's an innate sort of chronological order to all of this. Um, and so we might want to treat these things differently than we did before. Now, you don't need to. Uh, we might think that that chronological order is important, but it's not super important. Uh, but I think in this case, you might, you, you would, it's pretty important, okay? <laughs> like, um, the chrono if you were actually doing this, the chronological order here would be, would be actually quite important. Um, now, uh, the, the nice thing about this is, is neural networks have a really great way to go ahead and deal with this. Um, uh, linear regression and gradient boosting models, they do have actually like okay ways to deal with this, right? You can have an input state for the first month, an input state for the second month, blah, blah, blah. So it's not as bad as the situation we were dealing with before. But again, uh, neural networks have a very, very intuitive way of dealing with this. So uh, let's go ahead and build the data set. If you want to skip ahead to after the data set is built, just go ahead and click this link up here, um, and then you can you know, skip ahead. So we're using the make classification data set because I have started, that's the thing I used to, to start off with. You guys are familiar with it. Um, maybe I shouldn't be using this because it's starting to become really cumbersome to make these types of data. Um, once again, we do standard scalar to these because again, each we treat each statement kind of independently and then we just standardize them all. Um, so we just standardize all of these credit card statements or all these statements. Um, I did it in a very similar way where there's there's four initial types of statements. Um, so in this case, uh, I go ahead and I sort of split them into their into their different classes. Um, I went ahead and I've got uh, I want five thousand points per default and non-default class. I've got different distributions. So this distribution will start off with. Uh, having 0.5 and 0.5, and this distribution will start off with having 0.2. So it looks very similar to the way that we were doing it in the uh, in the convolutional neural network or the variable length feature lesson, which you can check out here. Um, the only difference is that as I, so when I choose the first credit card statement that it gets, so in this case, if, if I choose that it's statement number two, I go ahead and I, in, I increase the chance that it's going to be statement number two afterwards. Right, and and the the in, in the intuition behind this is that you know there are two types of two types of people, or there's two types of statements that you can get in which case it, which would uh, simulate you having a good loan. So in this case, it's a point. You, you've got 50% for the first one and 50% for the second one. But if in the first month you had the second type of statement, you're very likely to have that second type of statement in the next month. And if for two previous months you had that type of statement, you're super likely to have it in the next month. Um, so, it, you know, in, in a real, um, this, this is something that you might see in a real data set, it's something you might intuit in a real data set, um, which is why chron like the chronological order of this might help a lot. Um, 
in this case, the first statement that you actually get, um, uh, which might be the most recent or it's the most previous one, is, is the one that matters the most. Uh, and so you might care about that one quite a lot because the rest of them are all dependent on that first one. Um, so anyways, uh, we, we basically use that to go ahead and make these data sets. It's a lot of code here. Feel free to read it. I, I always include the GitHub links down below. Uh, and I make the data set. Um, once again, I've got a data set that's going to look like this takes actually a little bit of time, surprisingly. Um, I've got a data set that has 5,000 points for each class. So the defaulters and then the non-defaulters, they've got 10 statements max. Uh, they range from three to 10 and I go ahead and I add zero statements. I zero pad those statements. Um, and then I've got uh, 30 features per statement. So very, very similar to the previous example. The only thing is that these statements are now ordered. There is a distinct order to these statements. They are, and the order is, is represented by the fact that these statements aren't independent of each other. They are actually dependent on the previous statements on what you got. Um, so once again, we, we need it to zero pad because we're not going to be doing batch-based sampling with the neural network down below. If you guys are interested in seeing me do batch-based sampling, I'm starting to think that that would be probably a good lesson. Uh, leave a comment down below. If I get a couple of comments or, or a couple of likes on those comments that say like, Nate, I need to see this batch-based sampling. You've talked about it a lot um, and it would help me. Uh, I would be happy to do it. It would, it would actually not be super long. So now that we have our data, um, so now that we have our data, we can go ahead and we can, um, uh, we can start the neural network stuff. Um, so we do bootstrap sampling. It's totally fine. It's the exact same thing as we did before. And then the neural network. We have all numeric inputs. The numeric, the numeric inputs are 10 by 30. Um, so again, 10 statements, uh, 30 uh, data points each, uh, or 30 features per statement. And those features might be you know, the amount of money that you paid, the number of days late you were, whatever. Um, the difference is that instead of using a convolutional neural network, instead of applying the same function to each one, what we do is just a slightly, just a little bit different. We apply, well, we do apply the same function to each one. So we, in this case, it's a little bit different. So we got the first statement. So the, the metaphor is we look at the first statement, we extract some features from that first statement and we keep that in our head. And we think like, okay, that's useful. Now we look at the second statement, given that information from your first statement, right? And we, and we extract some things from that. And then we look at the third statement and we use the things from the first and the second statement to go ahead and look at the third statement. So, right, we, we kind of keep this idea of memory. So we're, we're remembering the first statements that we do. Now that first statement doesn't have any context for, for all the future statements. And so what we do is we look at this in a bi-directional way. So first we start from the, the first in our set and then we start from the last in our set and then we work our way down. So if, if you wanted to sort of think about this as a human being acting as this neural network, I would go ahead and I'd start from the earliest uh, credit card statement. I'd read over it. I'd look at the next one, remembering that information from the first one, I'd read over it and I'd, I'd continue on until I read all of them. And then I'd start once again, completely fresh. I'd look at the last credit card statement with a clear mind I look at the previous to last one, remembering that last one, and then I'd repeat and repeat and repeat. And I'd take both of those things and I would, I would, um, and this, I concatenate them together. I'd take the evidence that I got from looking at them chronologically forward and chronologically backward, and I'd add them together, right? And that's basically what I'm doing here. Um, so once again, this is going to be dropout. I do a bi-directional GRU, so a bi-directional recurrent neural network. Recurrent neural network is what I use to look at ordered variable length features. Um, even ordered features themselves, you can use a recurrent network for, but you can also use a dense network as well. So ordered variable length features, I go ahead, I use this GRU. Um, and then I, and this, this acts as kind of like our dense layer. And then I normalize. So once again, it's normalization, it's uh, regularization, and then it's uh, the layer. Um, now again, I can do that same bonus that I did with convolutional neural networks. So I can look at everything going forward and I look at everything going backwards. And then I can go ahead and take this global context, right? I can sort of think like, oh, okay, I've looked at everything. Now, how does this application look in total? Right, I keep that in my head. And now I go ahead and I look at each, each thing again in the exact same way that I did before. So I look at the first one with global information. And now I take that and now I've got 
the first one plus global information, I can look at the second one, and the second one plus global information. So I add a repeat vector, I concatenate the inputs onto this global information, um, I do dropout, bidirectional GRU, batch normalization, and then apply our uh, basic dense uh, neural network to it again. Um, so I want you to see how just composable this is. It's crazy. You take these, these concepts of, of normalize, regularize, layer, right? And we've used that throughout. You've always done this normalize, regularize, layer. Um, and now in this case, we just, we look at the data in a slightly different way. And we can compose this to go ahead and make some, uh, some cool assumptions about it. So uh, GRU, it, it applies a function to it. Again, it's a, it applies that same function repeatedly to two, th uh, to two things. So it, it goes ahead and it has a memory, right? It's because it's recurrent. So, well, I guess that doesn't really. But the, in, the, in the good old LSTM uh, type networks, then it would sort of make sense. Um, so it has a memory associated with it. Um, and then it uses the memory as in conjunction with the current process or the current uh, data that's processing to go ahead and figure out uh, what it should store in its memory next time. Um, I know I'm not sort of doing a lot of justice to the explanation of uh, recurrent uh, neural networks, and I'm not gonna. I'm not trying to. I'm not trying to explain exactly sort of what's going on under the hood, but instead I just kind of want to explain what the metaphor is for what's happening. Um, because you don't really need to know what's going on under the hood here, generally speaking, for most applications. Uh, what you sort of need to know is that it applies one function again and again to each of these each of these um, uh, inputs in order. So it's very good for ordered variable length features versus convolutional neural networks, which are very good for just variable length features, unless you go ahead and, and, and change them, um, and which you can do. And so something like uh, WaveNet is a good example of CNNs that are really good for ordered uh, variable length features. Um, so anyways, uh, as you can tell, neural networks, there's always, there's always more and there's always exceptions to the rules. Um, so we can go ahead and we can run these cells. Do, do, do. Um, and we can compile our neural network. Always it's good to look at the uh, network summary. And we note that in our network summary, we do have uh, more parameters uh, than we had before in the convolutional neural network. Convolutional neural networks are really crazy in how parsimonious they are, how, how small they are compared to other types of neural networks, which is why I think they're one of the most used. Um, but it's still going to be fewer parameters uh, than you would have had if you had a dense neural network, if you had tried to use like a linear regression techniques. Um, so we can go ahead and we can make our generator and we can fit. Um, it's kind of as simple as that. I, I hope the metaphor that I've been using of, of sort of a researcher sort of looking at these things and how they would go about and sort of look at them makes sense. Um, uh, if it doesn't make sense, sort of leave a, leave a comment below. And if you, of course, would like to sort of learn more about recurrent, notice this is much slower than our other ones as well. Um, and this is partly because TensorFlow is, is not the best at, at these recurrent neural networks. I've heard actually PyTorch is much, much better for them. I don't use these super often in my own work, but hey. Um, uh, but again, sort of notice that the, the general structure of this, this course is, okay, there's some new things about our data that we know, that we understand. Can we encode that information into our neural network to make it so that it's easier for it to learn? And generally the answer to that is yes, yes we can. Um, so this is, this is only the tip of the iceberg of what you could do for data like this. You know, as, as I told you, you know, doing batch-based sampling is something that's, that's probably good to, good to go ahead and do. But I think that we've, we've done enough to go ahead and, and work our way through a real example. So thanks, and I'll talk to you next time.